Hello, my name is Anna Corrin from CNN. Welcome to View from the Top. We are here with Laura Cha. She, of course, is the chairman of Hong Kong Exchanges. Laura, great to have you with us. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> We're here to talk about Asia's role in mm -hmm. sustainability. And I guess climate change, you know, yeah. you don't have to look too far to, to yeah. realise that this is mm -hmm. an existential crisis facing yeah. our, our time, our generation, yeah. the floods, the mm -hmm. wildfires, the mm -hmm. droughts, rising, you know, seas, the heating of the earth. I know that this is a cause mm. that is very dear to you. Yes and your commitment to sustainability. Yes. Tell us about that. I think um, sustainability first, I think it really affects every aspect of our life, you know, as an individual, as a family, um, and of course, as evidenced by COVID, I think it really brought home, the pandemic brought home the importance of uh, sustainability and sustainable living in all aspects. And climate change, of course, is a very important aspect of, of that. It's close to my heart because I think it affects really, as I said, you know, businesses, individuals, families, society, community. And then if we think about the next generation, our children, what kind of world they will be living in. And if we don't do anything, that a lot of the things that we've took for granted in nature uh, might not be there, might not be the same. And then, of course, the natural disaster that is caused by climate change. Mm -hmm. We see more and more in the last couple of decades, uh, more wildfires, um, uh, the flooding, mm -hmm. the droughts, mm -hmm. and all the social issues that come along with it. And it also has an impact on the, um, on the financial community because insurance is a big part. And then when you want to rebuild community, you need funding, you need finances. So it really hits every aspect of our lives. It's all integrated. Yes, isn't yes, it? absolutely. Well, the UN Climate Change mm -hmm. Conference, COP26, is coming up mm -hmm. in November. Yeah. And, and as we know, Asia as mm -hmm. a region is the largest emitter right. of, of greenhouse yes. gas. I guess, why has Asia been so slow in transitioning mm -hmm. uh, to a low carbon economy? I think uh, to start off, Asia is the continent that has the most population in the world. And also we have uh, the economies in different stages of its development. Mm -hmm. We have developed uh, economy like Japan, like Australia, uh, etc. And then, of course, we have developing uh, countries uh, that consist of most of most of Asia. And uh, it is not surprising that with the most population and with varying degree of development, it has it has become the world's largest uh, uh, emitter. Now, of course, with, if we think about it from another angle, globalization has brought supply chain to Asia in the mm -hmm. sense that we are the manufacturer uh, hub of many of those centers that were originally in the West. So, you know, in a way, the emitting industries have shifted to some degree to Asia. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of uh, contributing factors, but that's a reality we have to live with. And I think I like the term common goal, but differentiated responsibilities mm -hmm. in the sense that we are in it together. We have to do things together, but different economy might have a slightly different time frame, And that's why we call it differentiated um, ambitions or our program. Uh, and, but nevertheless, the common goal is to reduce carbon um, emission and reach carbon neutral. Mm -hmm. I, I guess with the challenges come opportunities, right. and yes. something that, that you are seizing yes, upon. Yes, that's right. And uh, as I said, you know, with uh, a transition to, um, to a carbon neutral uh, economy, uh, changing from our current lifestyle to a more sustainable uh, lifestyle, uh, we need finances, we need money in to, to build, to um, restructure, uh, whether it is the restructuring or reconstructure after a natural disaster mm -hmm. or building new um, alternative uh, energy, wind farms, solar panels, and uh, all these that need funding, need finances, you know, green finance and um, how do we transit into a green economy? It needs to, it needs, you know, funding to make it work.
And so that's where the financial market comes in. And that's where the exchanges can play a role. We know that President Xi has committed China mm -hmm. to becoming carbon neutral by 2060. Yeah. Here in Hong Kong, I think the target is 2050. Right. Japan, South Korea, right. they are also on board. Mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, mm -hmm. capital markets play a major role in this. As chairman of Hong mm -hmm. Kong Exchanges, I mean, what role is your company playing in the region's journey to sustainability? Uh, I think HKEX has a very unique role because we have three different aspects of our role. First, as a regulator, we can and we have mandated our listed companies to up their disclosure requirement. Uh, from 2013, where we produce a guideline. Listed company, you should you know, follow these guidelines and then to 2017 to 2019, we make it mandatory disclosure. Now, granted, a lot of the smaller companies are still grappling with what does that mean? What can we do? But the awareness has been raised. There's no question about it. And so, you know, every listed company has to disclose in their annual report what they have done in that space or, you know, is comply or explain. You explain what are your goals and what you intend to do if you haven't done so. So I think that is a major step. And then as a market um, operator, we provide the ecosystem. We try to encourage listing of, you know, green products and and so on. And so that will become a, a, a ecosystem where there will be more awareness and more professionals in the field. And that's also answering to the investors demand. There are many now portfolio managers that would want to allocate a certain portion of their asset under management to green products. Mm. So that's another area. And finally, we are a corporate, we are a listed company. Mm. We have to lead by example. We set the standard of what we can do. And then, of course, we also, through our, our foundation, our philanthropy arm of HKEX, contribute to the community, help the community mm. try to achieve these aims. Do you think by making it mandatory for these companies mm -hmm. to explain what they're yeah. doing puts people on notice? It definitely put people uh, on notice. It, it was met with some resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be honest about it. And uh, there are some smaller companies that this will find, what does that mean for my company? You know, what can we do? So we give them tutorial, we give them guidelines and programs to help them. Because I guess there's, there's some investment that goes into yes. it, isn't there? When, yes. when you become greener yes, in, in what you right. are doing. Yes. So yes. the initial outlay is more for a lot yes, of these companies. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, if you look at Asia, uh, China is now the world's larger producer of solar panels mm. and uh, electric cars. They sell more electric cars than anywhere else. So the transition is happening. And all that innovation will help Asia uh, in the transition because, you know, you, when you transit from a coal-based economy to a greener one, you need these renewables. Mm. And where do they come from? You need these, you know, equipments and technology innovation. I've seen that, well, now glasses that have solar panel embedded, embedded in the glasses mm. so that in the future, the entire building will be solar energy empowered. So these are things that are happening. Yeah, the potential is limitless, yes, really, yes. when you think about it. The global uh, sustainable finance market mm -hmm. has attracted something like $30 trillion yes. in investment, yeah. but less than 1% of yes. that is here yes. yeah. in Asia. Mm -hmm. um, why is that the case and, and what's being done to change that? I think why was that the case? I think Asia um, has been a little late in the game coming to the realization about the transition uh, because, you know, large part of Asia is still in the developing uh, economy. And, uh, but I think now the awareness is there and uh, it's catching up. And uh, because of the size of the, the Asia as a whole, the opportunities are huge. I think it is catching up. Um, uh, we have seen increase in uh, green finance as a product. And um, I think it, it's, it's a matter of, you know, catching up to do. We do have to catch up. Mm -hmm. how, how do you encourage these companies mm -hmm. to, I guess, embed ESG considerations? I think it has to come from to both top down and bottom up. One, um, 
I think companies now, the younger generation, they naturally they have a, a much more um, keener affinity about the environment, about you know or social issues. So that is generally the case. I would say generally, mm -hmm. but it also need to have the leadership from the top. So I think we are trying to encourage the boards of listed company, as an example, to set the sustainable. Uh, agenda, sustainability agenda. So it has to be both ways. And then of course the government plays a role in that. Um, Hong Kong's um, government had committed to reach uh, carbon neutral by 2050 mm -hmm. and there is a blueprint that will come out soon that you know we're telling how much of our energy, the electricity will be will be you know generated by uh, renewable energy and the waste, for example, the disposal. And so each, the government plays a role as well as the private sector. So together, I'm hoping that will bring us um, closer to, uh, to, to reaching our, our goal. Do you think this, this is being driven, this movement mm -hmm. is being driven by investors who, who perhaps are, mm -hmm. are more aware, socially conscious of, of what is going on? In the world? I, I think it's uh, certainly investors play a role, but I think there's a large body of advocates who have seen the devastation of the, uh, the havoc that, that has been created by climate change. Mm -hmm. So the investor is uh, certainly a very important element that will really spur uh, companies to, to, to look about it. And when we will go out to talk to institution investors, a lot of investors want to know what are your ESG agenda? And what are you doing about it? And I think particularly the larger corporate has a responsibility to set examples and to lead the, the, the change. So when did you think, mm -hmm. when do you think this became a thing? You know, you'd go to these meetings yeah. and people would mm -hmm. say, what is your ESG agenda? Yes. When that, I think um, probably uh, last five years, but the pandemic has really heightened everybody's uh, attention. I think in the early years, I think it's more than, more than five years, it's been 10 years. I used to chair the CSR committee at HSBC and where climate was a very big issue in those, in the, even in the early days. Uh, but there was talk about it and then it gradually became more mainstream. And then I think the pandemic really swung people around. You have said that the, the pandemic, COVID, has been a wake up call mm -hmm. for business. Yes. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Um, to talk about, let's say, the financial sector. Mm -hmm. uh, people think that, you know, we are just manufacturing a company, a manufacturer. But then, you know, if climate change affects the supply chain, you know, if uh, flooding is occurring somewhere, your products could not be distributed. So it affects down, upstream or downstream, both ways, right? Mm -hmm. And in the financial sector, we also see that happening. Companies' profit might be impacted because of the lack of raw material being delivered in time. Um, that happened particularly so during COVID. And then also um, companies that feel that if they are more um, conscious about the environment, they have more attention from the investors. And of course, you know, in the financial market, we can create green products that allow the investors to participate. And last but not least, of course, is the insurance sector, mm. right? I mean, every time you have a natural disaster, the insurance company and then somebody else's premium will have to go up. So it's all, you know, it's all together. We're all in it together. Are you amazed at, at how resilient the, the financial markets have been mm. to, to COVID, to, to this pandemic over what yeah. is almost now two years? Two years. Yes, I think um, uh, the financial market has shown tremendous resilience. This is on a global basis, mm. um, not only just in Hong Kong, but elsewhere. Um, I think it, it's um, a testament to the strength and uh, the, the robustness of the system that was built from the last financial crisis. I think the structure, um, people are much more aware of the risk involved in just about everything we do. Um, so the, the awareness, the attention and the preparedness for that 
had enabled the, the market to survive. Yeah. Okay. Much of Asia lags behind international best practices in how companies manage and report their uh, ESG mm. risks and impacts. What can HKEX do mm. to improve this record? Oh, I think uh, one exchange by itself it might not be that easy. I think the important thing is really to try to harmonize or standardize the taxonomy, the standards, because the disclosure is one thing, but people disclose different things based on different standards. Mm. So I think there are now a pretty strong voice in saying that we need to look at the taxonomy and the standards. Uh, much more seriously in order to have um, a coordinated effort. Otherwise, some disclosure are not quite the same as other disclosures. So as an investor, you look at these disclosures and you might not be able to really understand. Yeah. Is it a matter of shaming or exposing mm. non-compliant companies or is it giving them incentives? I think it's probably giving them incentives, mm. but then there is an element that you know, you've, a company might feel embarrassed if they are behind in a certain way, or the investors will point that out, right? Mm -hmm. So mostly, I think what we want to do is to incentivize the companies. Okay. You are a, a very strong advocate mm -hmm. on the board's commitment to, to driving the sustainability agenda. What more do you believe that boards uh, can be doing to promote ESG, sustainability, and climate resilience for business? Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, it will be the board that set the direction. And the commitments come from the senior management and the board. And then it's a matter of implementation. Um, it is very important for companies to be able to measure uh, what we have, you know, what the company has done. And I feel that it's the same at the exchange as well. We talk about it a lot and we want to see the talk translated into action and, um, and we measure the actions by, by measurable goals, mm -hmm. you know, and targets. And uh, so, you know, you, you really have to have some hard numbers to look at and to realize, you know, how much more you should do or how much you should you know, how much you have done. Mm -hmm. and sometimes how much you have done is also a good incentive. Greenwashing yes. is, is a problem. Yes. Uh, companies, I guess, misleading or deceiving yeah. uh, consumers, among others, of their green mm -hmm. credentials. What do you believe needs to be done to combat this? It's not easy. It comes back to, you know, if we have a common set of taxonomy and standards, that would be a lot easier to distinguish um, rather than people just using the narrative. Um, and at the end of the day, in the, certainly in the financial market, the investors, the institutional investor has a very strong voice mm. and they will help expose if one could, you know, this is not real green, it is just greenwashing. So um, heightened understanding, heightened um, uh, awareness of turning talk into action, all these will help the, the greenwashing, to so combat greenwashing. Do you think it's up to the investors, I guess, to be truly invested yes, in, yes. In, in what they're um, part of? Yes, I think um, the, uh, if we come back to, you know, the exchange can mandate these rules. Mm. Uh, we can say whether you meet these rules or not. And unlike uh, in a financial statement, you can't just say you, you know, you're profitable, you have to show. The green is a little more nebulous and therefore it requires probably a different kind of uh, angle to analyze how green is your green story. Mm -hmm. So um, I, as with other uh, development, I think this will also become more mainstream in the sense that investors would scrutinize the company's disclosure. Now that we have disclosure, then people will want to know how accurate are your disclosure. Uh, uh, watchdog bodies, do, do they play a role well, in this? I'm not sure, you know, I think uh, we do not want to create another 
oversight body, so to speak. Um, and then if you make it too much of a regulatory burden, then you know people, you know, sooner or later people will just find it that they lost the main goal sure. of doing good rather than just complying, right? So I think the focus should be this is what you should do because it's good for your company, it's good for society. Yeah. Earlier this year, mm -hmm. the United States and China issued a joint statement addressing the climate crisis facing this mm -hmm. planet. Uh, tell us more about China's role mm -hmm. in the global carbon neutrality roadmap. I think it was uh, very good uh, that the central government announced that they will be carbon neutral by 2060. Um, it was interesting because I think before that announcement was made, most people in China didn't realize what that means. Mm. But because the government has a stated policy, stated timetable, I was recently in China, a lot of people were talking about how do we reach um, peaking by 2030 and carbon neutral by 2050. So the awareness all of a sudden is there. And it's amazing, you know, because then, you know, of course, before this announcement, already China is quite uh, advanced in the mm. solar panels, the, the wind farm, and so on and so forth. And now there is even more incentive. So I think China can play a role um, in not only in the technology innovation aspect, and also by producing the, um, the equipment, the devices that will help the transition, but also it will lead, hopefully lead by example, um, by collaboration with mm -hmm. other countries. I think that is an important aspect because no one country can do it on their own and it has to be a collective effort. And um, given China's size of its economy, size of its population, and now with the stated goal, timetable, I think it really rally and focus the attention and the energy of, uh, of these people. Uh, President Xi's announcement mm -hmm. caught many off guard. People right. were shocked to, yeah. to know that he'd you know, set yes. that time. Yeah. I mean, China has the, the potential to be a world leader in this yeah. space. Oh, it, I think it has. Um, but before he announced, obviously, there has been a lot of research done. Mm. And I remember probably 10 years ago um, in Davos, at, um, at the meeting um, in Davos, that uh, uh, the Chinese delegation then, 10 years ago, this is probably even more than that, mm. they were already telling me, and I was kind of in disbelief, that the amount of um, energy that will be replaced, coal-fired energy that will be replaced by wind energy in those days, and they were telling me then that the technology they were working on was to improve the wind, the, the blades of the wind, the, the windmill, mm. right? I had no idea that they say that in the northwest of China, there's a lot of wind coming from right. the north, but the wind is full of sand. Right. So that it slowed down and the blades worn out quite quickly. So at that time, 10 years ago, they were improving on the technology so that the blades, so that you, know, you can't stop the wind bringing sand from the desert, mm -hmm. it will be improved so that it's... Um, efficient. It's efficient. Yeah. So this is more than 10 years ago. Wow. So I think the government's announcement, of course, was a surprise, but tons of research has been done before then. Yeah, for sure. Hong Kong, mm -hmm. where we live, mm -hmm. plays a very special role in connecting East yes. uh, and West. How influential is Hong Kong in the development of green finance in Asia, specifically mm. uh, to China and the Greater yeah. Bay Area? I think the two, two aspects that I can uh, think of, one is, of course, the Greater Bay Area. Right next to us, um, the central government has plans for, to develop the, the economy in the Greater Bay Area. And for Hong Kong, it's a natural extension of you know, a lot of the things that we can do. Finance is a, it's a, it's a key element. And the HKEX already has a, um, Shanghai Mercantile Exchange there. And we are 
um, a, a shareholder of the Guangzhou Futures Exchange. Mm -hmm. And here in the Greater Bay Area, we want to look into doing green finance there. The second element for Hong Kong, it's really going back to what I said earlier, is the financing hub. China is, will have huge, and they acknowledge that the huge financing need to do all these projects, and Hong Kong can play a role in helping to, to raise capital for those projects. It's an exciting time for Hong Kong. It is, it is, yeah. yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit more, I guess, about the role that, that investors play. Uh, I know we touched on it earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's been a trend to, to green mm -hmm. finance, and you mentioned yeah. that it's something that's been happening over the last five years. But do you think it's people thinking, you know, about the world around us, watching, I guess, climate mm -hmm. disasters unfold before our very eyes? Or is it people thinking more about their children, their grandchildren? Is, is that I a play? Think it's, yeah, I think it's both. I think, uh, unlike, I would say, 10 years ago, people still think about climate change as something quite far. Mm. But I think in the last 10 years, we can see all kind of natural disasters in every continent. I think that has a, a real impact. And of course, you know, the, the awareness of the, of the millennial and the younger generation, and that kind of focused everybody's attention as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would you uh, describe HKEX's own sustainability journey? What you have been on, considering yeah. you've been chairman for, it was since three 2018. Years, three years, yeah. yes. Um, we're still, you know, we're still in the early days of the journey, like everybody else. I think the early days, of course, we set it as an important agenda uh, for us to pursue. Um, and uh, from, as I said earlier, the three different fact facets of our role, as a market regulator, mm -hmm. as a corporate, and as a, um, as a regulator, so on. Um, it, uh, it now, I think, at a stage where we want to really see more action um, and more collaboration with, you know, for example, in the Greater Bay Area. There are lots of uh, opportunity to explore. Uh, so our journey, I think, very much like most people's, you start from the awareness and you are going, you're moving towards a, towards a goal. It helps that both, you know, central government had announced the plan, the target, and Hong Kong government, the SAR government, has also announced a plan. So now that, you know, you have, it's no longer just, oh, climate change. It's like 2050 for Hong Kong. And uh, we, we think our intermediate um, goal is by 2035 to reach half of uh, net zero. Mm -hmm. and, and so that you can be completely zero by 2050. So when you have these very structured, uh, people can see that there's a timeline, I think it will spur more action. Mm. So what is your, your message when you speak to companies? when the board speaks to companies? Uh, when we talk to companies, we really stress on the, um, the good that bringing sustainability into your business plan is good for your business. Mm. I think that at the end of the day, people will say, okay, it's good to talk about it, but what does that do for our business? So I think that that is a you know, if we look at developer, for example, Hong Kong, a big sector, mm. then they become aware about energy efficiency in their new building. And uh, it will matter to, you know, how investors look at them. It would affect um, their share price. Mm. Uh, it would affect the property price of the flats they're going to sell. Mm -hmm. So you really have to bring the sustainability into the business and then they can relate. I think that's what we generally do. And Laura, finally, any takeaways mm -hmm. for our audience who, who mm -hmm. are watching this in, in the sphere of, of sustainability? What's your message to them? I think sustainability is not just um, uh, an idea, not just a concept, but it will be a way and it should be a way of life. Something that we, we all yes. need to abide by. Yeah. Laura, absolutely wonderful to see you again. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your, your thoughts and your Thank insights. You. And, and congratulations on the amazing job that you're doing, leading by example. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you so much, Thank Anna. You, Laura.